Welcome to Stories of Sacrifice, World War II American POW MIAs in the Philippines. This is a production of the U.S. POW MIA Family Locating. I'm your host and lead researcher, John Bear. Technician, 5th class, Julius St. John Knudsen, was born the 3rd of January, 1916, the eldest child of Louis and Betsy St. John Knudsen of Brainerd, Minnesota. He entered the service at Fort MacArthur, California, and was first assigned to the 41st Division on 31 March, 1941. He later requested transfer to Fort Lewis, Washington being assigned to the 194th Tank Battalion. In late 1941, General Douglas MacArthur made reinforcing the defenses of the Philippines a top priority. The 194th Tank Battalion was created for this purpose, combining National Guard units from Minnesota, Missouri, and California. Company A of the 194th Tank Battalion, the unit to which Knudsen was later assigned, had originally been a Minnesota National Guard unit based in Brainerd, Minnesota, Knudsen's hometown. As the threat of war looked increasingly likely, the War Department federalized the unit on 10 February 1941 and dispatched it to Fort Lewis, Washington, where it was mustered as a part of the 194th Tank Battalion, but later shipped off to the Philippines that fall. On 7 December 1941, hours after the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, They also attacked the Philippines. American and Filipino forces held off the Japanese until General King surrendered the Bataan forces on 9 April 1942. This was the start of the notorious Bataan Death March, a 65-mile march of death to the northern POW camps. Many atrocities were done to the American and Filipino forces on this march, and possibly to Julius. Witness accounts said Knudsen made a break for the jungle during the march. Later, those witnesses said they heard a shot ring out in the direction that Julius had escaped. He was never seen again. Other accounts listed him as dying on 30 June 1942 at POW Camp Cabatatuan. But he doesn't show up in the camp records, nor the list of those who were buried at the camp cemetery. He is currently listed as missing in action. This is Julius' story told by his nephew Jim and his family struggle to get Julius home. I'd like to welcome Jim Knudsen to the show today. Jim is the nephew of technician 5th class Julius St. John Knudsen. Hi Jim, how are you doing today? Hi John, uh, thanks for interviewing us today. And Yeah, I'm uh, the nephew of Julius St. John Knudsen. Uh, he was uh, uh, th- uh, one of three boys in uh, my grandparents' family, my dad, Julius, and another uncle, Richard, and all three of them served in World War II. Uh, my grandparents uh, both came from Superior, Wisconsin, but moved to Brainerd, Minnesota. My grandfather was a county engineer surveyor, and uh, they lived in Brainerd. And my uncle Julius uh, was born January 3rd, 1916 attended the local schools, and ended up in the uh, time frame of the Depression like everybody did in the 30s. And uh, long about the late 1930s, there was not a lot of work in the Brainerd area, so he hopped on his Indian motorcycle and rode to California looking for work and ended up as a truck driver out in Southern California. And that would have been uh, in the late 30s and early 40s. And uh, the next uh, 
the thing I can say is the family of uh, that I'm involved with, uh, there's seven of us siblings, and a lot of us really had no idea about who Uncle Julius was because none of us were born before he perished in the Philippines. So from that perspective, uh, it was my dad uh, that kind of held it out uh, in his own mind through his whole life as to not knowing what happened and would love to know what happened. And uh, my dad passed away 10 years ago now and still, of course, didn't know what happened to his brother. But uh, Julius was a cantankerous person, according to my dad. Uh, He wasn't a panty waist. Uh, He'd stand up to anybody that uh, was doing wrong. He was involved in the school and tumbling. Uh, He and some friends uh, got involved with community work with beard growing contests. Uh, He wore stilts in uh, various events and parades. So he was always wanted to have some fun. But of course, uh, after high school, he had to find work and that's how he ended up in California. Uh, While in California on uh, March 31st, 1941, he enlisted in the California Army Guard and was assigned to uh, the Company M, 163rd Infantry. Well, they were then assigned uh, to go to Fort Lewis, Washington for training. And uh, that's where my uncle found out that the Brainerd 194th Tank Battalion was also at Fort Lewis, Washington for training. He requested a transfer and they approved it and yet the records of that transfer uh, have disappeared, possibly in the uh, fire in St. Louis of military records. We don't know. But he was transferred to the 194th so he could be with his hometown friends. And so, of course, from Fort Lewis, Washington, the 194th, among all other soldiers and equipment, were shipped out to the Philippines on the USS Coolidge, in September of 1941, and uh, were assigned to uh, protect Clark Airfield outside uh, Manila for a pending Japanese attack. And from there, uh, the war uh, started December 8th, uh, actually eight hours after Pearl Harbor. And uh, that's where the 194th Tank Battalion became the first mechanized tank battalion involved in World War II. So. That's the the start of my introduction of how my uncle ended up uh, in the Death March of Bataan, uh, which, of course, happened in 1942. But that's how he ended up getting there. Okay. And he he was the he was the oldest out of all the all the siblings. Isn't that correct? Yes, he was. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah, my uh, dad was three years, three years younger. And then another uncle, Richard, was another five years younger. And I should mention, my dad ended up in the Navy uh, flying blimps, and my other uncle Richard also was in the Navy, and I'm not sure what his assignment was. I know it was a a ship assignment somewhere, but I'm not familiar with his military background. So all three boys, you know, joined the military because that's what they did back in those days. (laughs) That's great. Um so he he enlisted there in California after after traveling out there, and he 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 did a lot of time around uh, uh, Washington State. Um, so you you were saying that yep. because of the depression, it kind of it, you know him looking for work, it kind of took him out that way. Um, what what kind of work was going on around uh, Brainerd? I mean, what what kind of industry was there locally? Well, uh, probably in the 1930s, there wasn't a lot of industry other than possibly forest, uh, wood cutting, uh, a lot of logging was going on. Uh, there was a paper mill, and there was also a, a railroad uh, spur point here in Brainerd where they did uh, railroad repair uh, on equipment. And there were only so many jobs available, and even those had tapered off during the Depression. So. Uh, there weren't a lot, and I think uh, as a uh, early 20s type of uh, age, he was probably looking for something more adventurous than uh, working at a paper mill or a railroad depot. So, yeah, I don't blame him. And what was your grandfather doing at the time? You know, you had sent me some audio files uh, that we'll get into here in just a bit, but uh, he was talking 
talking about, was it mining or was it logging? Well, my grandfather was a county surveyor, engineer, and they were involved with uh, anybody that had to do mining in the area, had to go through the county engineering department and surveying so that nobody would do any mining operations on public property. But uh, he, he had a private surveying business before he became the county surveyor, and so he did a lot of surveying out in the county around uh, the Brainerd area. And my dad and my uncle, I'm sure Julius also were help him in the summer on their summer work, helping hold the rods up in the air while his um, grandfather looked through his sextant to find survey corners, section corners. So the surveying was quite prevalent in our family back in those days. Okay. Okay. Um so after he he got shipped off to the Philippines, you know, the 194th went to the Philippines, um, he had sent me some files about uh, um, about the family recording uh, albums or records to uh, send over to uh, the Philippines to all the, the members of the 194th. Can you tell us a little bit yes, about I'm, those? I'm, yeah, I'm finding out uh, for some reason we've had these records for years after my dad passed away. Uh, out of us seven siblings, I'm the only one in Brainerd. So I was, of course, left, left or blessed, as you might call it, with a lot of stuff. And uh, th- there were files and, and books and things. And there were some old records that are about the size of a 45 RPM record, but they don't have the big hole in the middle. They got a small hole in the middle. And one day my wife found them while she was cleaning house, and uh, we didn't have a record player that would fit that. And so I took it to a local music store that has uh, audio equipment, and they were able to transpose those records uh, into digital format. And for the first time, we listened to these records, and they were made at the Brainerd Armory, uh, some organization that my uh, grandmother and grandfather were involved in for supporting the military, arranged for a recorder to come to town and be set up at the armory so the local families of soldiers could come in and record a message to their loved one for the upcoming holiday. And so my grandfather made one recording, my grandmother made a recording, and then my dad and my other uncle Richard made a recording uh, to greet Julius uh, over in the Philippines. And uh, those recordings turned out amazingly clear after they were digitized, including uh, my dad's dog Thor was a bulldog, uh, or a boxer I should say, barking in the background while they're doing their recording. <laughs> so it's uh, it was an amazing find uh, when we had these uh, recordings done. And my understanding is once they were all done at the Brainerd Armory, they were packaged up and sent to Colonel Miller in the Philippines. But it's our understanding most likely they never got there because the war had started and a lot of all those records came back. And a few other people in Brainerd have found some. Um, and they had never had them digitized, so they did, didn't know what they had. But those records all came back to Brainerd basically unopened and unplayed. And so we have recordings now of not only my dad, but my uh, grandma and grandpa, who have been passed away since the uh, late 50s. And wow. we've never heard their voices before. And here they are, just like they're sitting in your living room. It's really amazing. And those records were being done all over the country. I would encourage people to, you know, contact their local uh, Army people, legions, VFWs, and see if anybody has re- remembers these records because they're really a cherished uh, family entity. Well, I'd like to, I'd like to try to try to share the one of your your grandmother uh, here real quick. Yeah. I want you to go ahead and listen to it, and I'm gonna give this a try and see if it works out for us here. Uh, if not, I'll I'll put it on the end of put them on the end of the podcast, but. Uh, Uh, I want you to go ahead and listen to this and see what kind of comments you might have after. Hello, Judy. This is Mother. I want you to know that this was Dad's idea, and it's just taken the town by storm. Uh, I went downtown to find out first if there was a machine that could be used, and John Linneman is running a machine for us. And Dad talked to Henry Mills and to Frank Johnson, who were in charge of the local home guard now, and got the use of the armory. 
And the newspaper has been just wonderful putting in uh, uh, three different articles about this. They even took a list of some of the boys whose people didn't have telephones. I didn't know how to get in touch with them to be sure that they knew about it. And so the newspaper took down the names of, of those boys and their folks have called and uh, everybody's had a great time over it. John Linneman was here until half past 12 last night, although his hours were supposed to be from 7 until 9. Um, he, he had a fine time with those people that were there last night, and tonight will be just as bad, if not worse, I guess. I telephoned to so many people and some parents that I've never seen and possibly never will, but we've chatted about you boys and had a fine time about it all. Uh, Aunt Donna uh, sent us a road map yesterday and a bulletin with the attractions of Portland and so on. I guess she's thinking that she's going to get us out west for a trip. Uh, I'm going to wish you a Merry Christmas now, Judy. Goodbye. Right. You know, and in that record, I remember she called him Judy because that was her nickname for Julius. And uh, my dad even grew up uh, calling him Judy. Uh, they just found it easier to say Judy than Julius, I guess. But... Everyone called him Uncle Judy. So. Hello, Junis. This is your dad. I want to wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. We're all busy here at home. And uh, we've got a big job in the North Country. And uh, Don and uh, Mr. Carlton and several other of the boys that you know are working for me. We're going to be busy all winter here. And uh, our Spring Valley job is going along. We're fighting some freight rates right now so as we can get to ship the ore. We're going to develop this thing in the spring, and uh, I think that we'll have a lot of things for you boys to do when you get back to this country, which I hope will be soon. Now, I hope that you aren't getting too much heat. We know that you're in the other end of the world and that you're having your summer now, but... Do what you can, fella, and I wish you a Merry Christmas again, and hope you'll get along in good shape right soon. Hi, Jude, old boy. This is Yip talking. I hear it's kind of warm down there. Temperature here is getting to the darn cold stage. Probably by the time you can hear this record, we will have had 40 below. But I won't be here to feel it anyway. I'm going to the Anderson School of Aeronautics in L.A. Expect to be there in November sometime. Jim Alderman's in Fort Sill, Oklahoma now. It's dead in the devil here in town. All my pals are in the Army or Air Corps except Joe Graham, and he's married now. Bob Mann's in St. Paul working in the Emporium. Marge Gustafson asks about you once in a while, and so does Al Newey and Doc Hokinson and Bill Gaffney. Bill Fisher's in California working now in an airplane factory. Al Trummeld and Zane and R.B. are still around. Frank Hickerson's married and is working for S.R., Dick Geist in Seattle, and I see Carl Zoppi once in a while with his DuPont wife. He asks about you. I guess that's all I got to say. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. I'm about six foot tall now, Jude, and I weigh 158 pounds. I'm a junior in high school, and I'm vice president of the class. My subjects are English and American history, art, picture, drawing, and cabinet making. I'm making a cedar chest in cabinet making. Uh, the prom is going to be a pretty big affair this year. I wish you were here to see it. I'm on the stage doing working on the junior class play now. Uh, Thor, we had a hard time to get him in here, but he finally came, and we brought a can of dog food in, so he'd be sure to come in. We were going to make the record yesterday, Monday, but uh, Thor wasn't around at the right time, so we had to wait till it's noon. Well, that's all I've got to say. Goodbye and good luck. Come on, speak! That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's kind of cool that you got that family history now, you know, and and being able to hear their voices and uh, beings that they 
passed before you really got to meet him, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, none of us had much chance to be with them because they passed uh, uh, early in their lives compared to today's uh, lifestyle. But uh, to remember their voices, uh, I was, I think, seven or eight years old when my grandfather died, so I never remembered his voice. I was, We lived in uh, Council Bluffs, Iowa, for quite a while while they were in Brainerd, so we'd only see them maybe once or twice a year. So it was really fun to hear their voices. Yeah, it's too bad you don't have a recording of Julius. Yeah, that that was the flip side. I wish he could have sent one back. So he, they got over to the Philippines, and and uh, it was just uh, you know December seventh, like like you were saying, just a few hours after Pearl Harbor was attacked. Uh, the Philippines was attacked as well, and they were they were stationed at Clark Field, weren't they? Yes, that's my understanding. Is uh, they were spread out. The 194th and the 192nd, both uh, tank groups were uh, more or less surrounding the area around Clark Field, tucked back into the trees and the bushes, uh, just in case of a pending attack. And uh, they were spread out pretty wide. Uh, uh, in talking with Walt Straka, who is still alive here in Brainerd, the only remaining 194th tank member, he's 100 years old now, and uh, he oh, said wow. we were spread out so far. He said, I never saw Julius after we were dispersed, he said, until the death march itself. And he said, because we all had orders and constantly on the move once they started to move. And he said it was uh, an experience that you didn't get to share except for the guys on either side of you, which could have been 100 yards away each way. So he said it was a, a different setup than what they had at Fort Lewis. Did did they did you ever find out what his uh, position was in the in the unit? Did he was he a no, driver uh, or? I asked. Yeah, that's. I was really curious about that. And Walt Straka, I just talked to him here on Veterans Day, uh, or uh, the uh, memorial service we had at Veterans Day here in Brainerd, and I asked him, and he's got a tremendously clear mind at a hundred years old. I said, do you remember what my uncle did? Did he drive a tank, radio man, mechanic, you know, uh, what was it? He said, once we got over there, he said, everybody did everything because you were a one-man unit, and that's it. And if somebody couldn't do something, somebody else picked up the the challenge. And he said, I don't know what his particular job might have been, but since he was a Tech 5, he might have been uh, advanced to something different than the guys that were in the tank with them that were just privates. Uh, nobody really understands, you know, those duties. Once you get in those tanks, it's everybody for for the group. It's not one man. So he, there's no idea what his actual challenge was. But being he was a truck driver in California and might have had a mechanical inclination, my guess is he might have been involved with uh, repair and possibly a leadership position in his tank group, in his tank. Yeah, and they had the old Stewart tanks, isn't that correct? Yes. Yes, and exactly. then the half tracks. The yeah, I don't know how much equipment their uh, tank group had. I know they had uh, motorcycles for relaying information. There were Jeeps, and I'm guessing there must have been some half tracks, but because they were a tank battalion, everybody's mind just goes to the idea of a tank all the time. And so he might have been the, uh, the honcho in charge of uh, uh, repair for a lot of different kinds of equipment or assigning certain guys to go do a job on that Jeep or that half track or that motorcycle, and he would guide them, I'm guessing, only because of his background as being a truck driver. But uh, who knows? You know, it's just sad that the records were destroyed of how he advanced from uh, private and Company M California uh, unit to a, a Tech 5 and a tank group. It, it's just hard to understand without the paper trail. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And it's too bad a lot of that, a lot, a lot of those records, like you were saying earlier, were probably lost in the 73 fire there in St. Louis. Yeah. They, when, on the day of surrender on, on, uh, on 8 April or 9 April, uh, they were at the southern tip of the, the Bataan Peninsula uh, when General King surrendered. Um, mm -hmm. And what you were telling us is uh, the last that anybody really ever saw of him was at the start of the march. 
or would, or, or do you know if it was at the start or midway through or at exactly when it was? Well, that's again the the, the multiple ideas uh, that come out of the paperwork. Uh, Colonel Miller's uh, notes that are uh, from the Washington archives. Uh, Colonel Colonel Miller states that he was last seen near the town of Labau, which is in the very northern end of the march before they got to O'Donnell. And yet another uh, situation, his actual death notice says he died in Camp Cabanatuan, which means he would have gone past O'Donnell and then all the way to Cabanatuan. But that cancels out if Miller's uh, recollection is true that he was last seen at Labau. And then while Straka says the last they saw him, was at Bonanga, and he ran into the woods. And they heard shots fired a little later in that general area. And the next day when the march started back up, they never saw Julius again. And they just talked amongst themselves that he must have got killed in the woods overnight. And that's what the shots were. And uh, then there's a historian out of uh, uh, Dover, Washington, Uh, that was working on his case, uh, trying to help us get an idea. And he said there's also some thought that a lot of the healthy guys along the death march were often pulled off of the march and loaded into uh, half-tracks and trucks and hauled off to repair bridges and roads. And there's one book I read recently by a local Brainerd uh, lady who had interviewed another member of the 194th by the name of Harold Peck. And Peck's comments to this lady during the interview said that he was on the march and saw Julius Knudsen in the back of a big truck and that he had a a bad hip and he had been limping. And he said they either took him for a work detail, which doesn't make sense if you're wounded or, or hurt, or they were carting off the ones that couldn't walk anymore and took them somewhere else and got rid of them. So there's, again, a lot of assumptions about where in the march he might have disappeared and where did they end up uh, taking him. And if he was on a work detail, those can go off 10, 15 miles in any direction to fix a road or a bridge for the Japanese. And if he crossed somebody the wrong way, he could have been done in on a a work detail somewhere, and then they just pushed him off into the woods and nobody ever buried him. So we really are totally 100% up on the air as far as where he might have ended up. But if he did make it to past uh, Bonanga and up to Labau, if he did make it to uh, O'Donnell, he never showed up on a a list there with the other uh, POWs. And if he did make it to Cabanatuan, he never showed up on the list there either. So we're up in the air as far as officially where he was, but the Army's official records say uh, died of dysentery at Camp Cabanatuan, yet there's no record to back that up anywhere. Wow. So how, how long have, has your family worked on this case with the, with the Defense POWMI Accounting Agency? Well, I should say my dad started uh, when he retired. Uh, he was in his 70s, and he started writing letters trying to find out some background And this would have been back in the uh, uh, mid-1980s when he started doing research and the Internet was not yet available. So he was writing handwritten letters and to congressmen and to the Army and this kind of thing. And it was really hard to get information. Everybody said, oh, those records were destroyed in the fire in 1973. And uh, kind of like pushing them off and saying, don't bother us, we don't have any information. And uh, once uh, my dad was uh, ill and uh, getting ready to uh, pass on, uh, the Internet had started coming alive with more access to more information. And uh, I told him I would pick up the gauntlet and carry on, and that's what I've been doing uh, since about 1995. And I've learned a ton of information and made contact with the – Uh, DPAA and the Fort Knox people uh, that help families try to find information. And they've been pretty good at responding and getting information. I had to file a Freedom of Information Act request. And uh, then we finally got uh, 
a list of his medals and awards. We never knew he had any. The family never received any. All the family ever had to know about Uncle Julius was a plaque signed by President Truman uh, with condolences from the United States government, and that's uh, a glass-framed uh, uh, kind of certification type of a thing. And uh, that hangs in my youngest sister's house. Her name is Julie, and she was named after Julius. So she's kind of the namesake of the family. Okay. But that, you know, <clears throat> and that uh, trying to go down that road of uh, information, it's just like a bottomless pit. You can always get a little of this and a little of that, and something new comes up. And But I've always had response when I contact uh, our caseworker in Fort Knox. And there's also a researcher uh, that has uh, a file that if anything comes new of uh, Uncle Julius, why uh, that would end up in his hands. And uh, my uh, oldest daughter, out of two daughters, and her husband, they attended a DPAA meeting in Minneapolis. It's about six years ago now. And so they're kind of up to speed on everything that I've been doing. And uh, I keep them informed of anything I find that's new. And uh, then we also went through the process of our local uh, military uh, cemetery near Brainerd called Camp Ripley. And they said uh, that Julius, as a MIA, uh, is eligible for a grave plot and a headstone. And uh, so we applied for that and got it, and it's in place. And uh, here coming up on December 14th, uh, they have an annual wreath lane ceremony at uh, Camp Ripley Cemetery, and we'll be attending that and placing the wreath. So we've uh, got a place for him to come home, and uh, we just hope that, you know, they have a – I hope that the Army takes a more aggressive approach to exhuming unknowns I just find that with today's DNA technology, that leaving them in a grave until they have a paper trail that says, oh, this might be Julius, uh, I, I feel that they should exhume every unknown uh, that's in a group grave or, or an individual by himself. I'm not saying to uh, do anything with the tomb of the unknown soldier or anything like that, but when over in the Philippines where they have so many group graves with mixed uh, uh, bones that they should be exhuming everything, DNA everything, and then put all the pieces together as best they can, and uh, then try to find families uh, with their DNA on file so they can make matches. And uh, our D DNA has been on file, both male and female, uh, well, about four years now, and uh, we just sit back and hope, and yet keep digging. Yeah, there's a there's quite a few of these families that I work with that, that you know that uh, have died at Cabatatuan, and that's that you know that's kind of the big issue is a lot, a lot of those remains were commingled. Um, yep. After after they were exhumed and uh, you know disinterred and taken to Manila to be identified in the mausoleum, and uh, unfortunately they used embalmers to try to work with these remains that were just you know skeletal. Uh, at that right. by that time, and uh, uh, they kind of made a mess of things, and uh, yeah. they ended up getting commingled worse. And those that they thought they could identify, they did, and those that they didn't think they could identify, they you know they were buried as an unknown in the Manila American Cemetery. Um, but exactly. one of the interesting facts that that you know people don't know is is uh, these remains, you know, being how they were so commingled. Uh, even the ones that were sent home, you know, after being identified in the 19, late 1940s and early 1950s, uh, uh, actually they didn't get the complete remains home. You know, it was a little mixture of everybody. And so right. that's one of the reasons why the, you know, the DPAA is wanting a 60% a family reference sample. You know, 60% of those associated with a, a, a group burial. Uh, they want 60% family reference samples on file before they'll disinter the remains and to make the identifications. And, you know, I don't know if that's arbitrary or not. And, you know, it's, you know there's different opinions on that. But, uh, and I, I, I agree with you. Um, you know, a lot of the f families that I've been working with, you know, they, they, you're all saying the same thing, you know, that they need to 
come up with a lead DNA process, you know, you know, lead DNA process where they do, yep. you know, disinter the remains, uh, get the DNA samples. And the reason why I think it's very important uh, is the longer those remains are in the ground, the more the degraded the, the DNA gets in the, in the bone. And uh, exactly. they won't, you know, after a few more years, it'd be hard to get any DNA out of them at all. Um, and then the other yeah, problem... It, it doesn't make sense to me that there there's any delay in doing exactly what you're talking about because the deterioration is only going to get worse. And then in 10 years, then somebody finally finds a piece of paper that says, oh, this might be so-and-so in this uh, certain uh, unknown grave. And by then, uh, the, the remains are so far gone that a DNA might not even be possible. It makes no sense to do any more waiting. Now, back in the 70s and 80s even, it might have made sense only because DNA had not advanced. But now that it has, good grief, they can get DNA off a hair. And they can get DNA out of a bone. So it's it's time to do it. I, I agree. I agree. And, you know, there's, there's I was, was of... going to mention earlier what I started getting off on, on that tangent of DNA there, but uh, I think just so everyone knows whether it's the 194th or the 197 tank group, and pretty much probably every soldier over in that uh, campaign, uh, when we found out that he had never received his uh, awards and medals, and we finally were able to get that, and we had a formal document from the Armory, and it says uh, Julius had earned the Bronze Star Medal, the Purple Heart, the Prisoner of War Medal, American Defense Service Medal with Foreign Class, Asian Pacific Campaign Medal with one Bronze Service Star, World War II Victory Medal, Presidential Unit Citation, Philippine Defense Ribbon with one Bronze Service Star, and Philippine Presidential Unit Citation. And those awards uh, went to everybody in the 194th and 192nd, as far as I know. They so did. In fact, they went a, to they went to uh, almost all POWs that were in the Philippines. Um, mm-hmm. uh, as a kind of a little side story, my what got me started on this campaign that I'm on is is uh, my brother-in-law's uncle died over there and it uh, in a POW camp, and he was actually buried next to. 192nd Tank Battalion and 194th Tank Battalion men uh, over at, uh, it was on, he was on a POW detail. He left O'Donnell, he was pulled out of O'Donnell and sent over to uh, yeah. a camp called uh, Camp Olivius and where they had to go back mm-hmm. down onto the Bataan Peninsula and uh, they were, it was a scrap metal detail. And uh, anyway, he ended up dying of malaria and dysentery there and was, was buried yeah. in an individual grave. Um, his own, uh-huh. so there was no commingling, and he was identified back in the fifties. But uh, um, yeah, that's yeah, kind this of this commingling and everything brings back. A, I did get one document from uh, DPAA a number of years ago, and it's uh, called the Unrecoverable Report from 1951, and uh, they were looking for my uncle among others, and in the report. It shows there the date of death is May 7th, 1942. The date of FOD, which I don't know what that stands for, finding June of death. 30th, 19, finding of death then was June 30th, 1942. But it said the date of death, May 7th, 1942. So where they might have got that information is interesting. Yeah. But it went on to say place of death or last seen, Cabanatuan. And then it has a case number, and then it was signed by a guy by the name of Katz, K-A-T-Z, in May of 52, and co-signed by Mansfield uh, a couple of days later in 1952, and then a case number. So they obviously opened a case thing, and they declared this, uh, I think it was seven or eight people on this particular list, unrecoverable. And so that kind of got my interest is, well, if they know the date of death was May 7th, where was everybody on May 7th? <laughs> yeah, that, that May 7th date, they came up with that. Is that That's when, uh, um, right after Corregidor surrendered, um, there was a lot of uh, okay. uh, men that, uh, you know, when in April, on 9 April, when, when General King surrendered the Bataan forces, a lot of those men made their way or escaped and made their way over to Corregidor to keep fighting. 
And so they were kind mm-hmm. of in a belligerent state, and uh, they actually didn't know exactly everybody that had made it over to Corregidor, so they kind of used that May date uh, in a lot of their correspondence. Did uh, did your family, you know, when do you know exactly when your your grandparents were notified about his uh, his death? Uh, we've never had an actual uh, official document that that they saved. I'm sure they got something, you know, from you know, be it a telegram and followed up by a letter from the War Department. I'm guessing, but uh, unfortunately. They never saved it uh, that we ever found in any paperwork after my folks passed. So, uh, again, that's a situation where uh, we go by the records that we've been getting from DPAA. And uh, the thing from Truman, of course, was I think uh, that stated in 1945 after they had declared him unrecoverable. Then he followed up uh, you know, with that plaque and stuff. But we don't have an actual paper document with any accurate information of any kind from the War Department. My dad did have correspondence with uh, one department because uh, he was questioning the life insurance policy. Once he was declared dead, his life insurance should have gone uh, to his mom and dad. And the War Department said that they had, uh, when he Julius filled out his military uh, information joining the military, he didn't give a beneficiary for his life insurance. And so my dad was questioning whether that was ever paid out. And again, the Army said, well, that information was destroyed in the fire, and we have no record of a beneficiary anyway, so they consider it case closed. Well, then my dad, of course, uh, thinks, uh huh, they're trying to avoid paying out the money uh, that he should have, the family should have gotten. And he said, my folks never talked about getting a check from the government for their $10,000 life policy. Right. <laughs> it's, 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 it's sad. You know, a lot of them guys didn't even list, you know, on some of their records, they didn't even show that they were, what their religious affiliation was either, you know. And, yes. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, this was, when they enlisted and stuff, this is all pre-war. They didn't, they're not really thinking about, oh, we're going to go to war and, <laughs> you know. So, That's right. You know, they didn't put a lot of that information down, but, you know, that's, it'd be, it'd be interesting if those records could ever turn up. Yeah. And and my dad, I remember after he got that letter, he sent one back and said, well, then show me a copy of the check that you sent to my parents. So I know that the uh, proceeds went to the family and he never heard back from that letter. (laughs) It was probably (laughs) a little, a little snarky. So yeah, I get I get some of that back from them too. Uh, they they don't ever want to answer me back on some things. But uh, so do you, currently um, with his case, do they? I I didn't take the time to get on the DPAA website to look. But do they have him listed as active pursuit, meaning that they they're going to try to identify him, or is he just still in a an MIA status? As far as I know, it's going to be strictly MIA at this point. Uh, once that document from 1952 says unrecoverable, uh, they're not doing a whole lot about digging deeper unless some information turns up that uh, Fort Knox or Dover, Washington, that might uh, find some history that leads them somewhere. My understanding is there's several uh, large groups of uh, uh, military currently in the Philippines uh, doing exhumations. But I don't know what their priority is, uh, what part of uh, the Philippines. It could be anywhere um, in Luzon, for that matter, or Corregidor. Who knows? And we have no indication as far as what direction they might take uh, to search further for my uncle because there's so many of them, uh, soldiers over there. Uh, and that goes back to our discussion earlier. There's so many that are unknown. And uh, let's let's just bring them all together and uh, separate them by DNA, uh, give them a temporary burial, whether it's in Hawaii or right there in Manila, until a DNA match shows up someday. Let, let's you know get the get the gang together and do the job that should be done right now. Oh, I agree 100 percent on that too. Um, you know, I think uh, I think our government could do a better job, and the DPAA uh, could do a a lot better job if they would uh, partner with more 
uh, non-governmental organizations and others that have, uh, you know, these labs that could act- actually uh, help support the, uh, the MIA effort. Um, That's right. You know, there's there's a lot more that could be done, and we just don't have a government at this point that's willing to do it, or at least go all in. Well, and I I remember the shakeup there a number of years ago in uh, Hawaii uh, because of the uh, misuse of information and the squelching of complaints from uh, field people uh, where the upper echelon was saying, we don't want to go down that road. We're going to stick to the old program. Well, finally... I don't know if it was uh, John Eakin or uh, Erickson. There's a number of guys that are very active private citizens in trying to shake the government into doing their job, and they had a major shakeup. Uh, uh, the head of the Defense Department in Washington finally called them on the carpet. And my understanding is they uh, reorganized the uh, Hawaiian effort and uh, moved people from the top and put them a little further down but kept them in place and there was still a mishmash, but at least I understand they opened a new uh, investigative unit in Omaha at off an Air Force Base to help take the uh, overload. Well, if they got that much work that they have to open a second office, then obviously they're starting to move in the direction that we think they should move, but not fast enough. And uh, if that means another shakeup in Hawaii and uh, adding more staff and bringing the right private contractors uh, whatever it takes, you know, the government should be giving them a blank check for doing whatever needs to be done. Yeah, I agree on that. Um, you know, there's, you know, at the current rate, even after the reorganization um, from DPMO to DPAA, um, at their current rate, and I think they're making what what last year was a little over 200 ident- uh, IDs, you know, with the yes, number sure. of, with just the number of World War II MIAs that are still on the books. I think there was like 78 oh, yeah. or 79,000 total, but a lot of those are deep water losses. But the ones that they actually right. have listed as active pursuit cases, meaning that they could be identified, and that's mainly the ones that are, you know, buried as unknowns or, or uh, terrestrial plane crashes that they could potentially find. Um, right. That's they're at, you know, somewhere between 30 and 38,000. Of these active pursuit cases that are on the books, and uh, you know, right now, the you know, without a without a lead DNA process or without a program in place uh, from our our federal government to go after, you know, to publicize and really really go after family reference samples, um, mm-hmm. it's going to take uh, hundreds of years to just get the MIAs identified at this current rate. Um, Absolutely. So they must have a tremendously large database in the uh, DPAA of uh, anyone who's inquired about a missing loved one in the last 20 years. There must be a database uh, of contact information that could be receiving a uh, twice a year uh, notice uh, and goes to whatever the current address is and saying, if you have not submitted your DNA sample, We strongly encourage you. It's free. Contact our office. I mean, from a businessman's perspective, that's how I would do it. Twice a year, every year, until somebody sends in a DNA sample or return to sender address no longer valid, whatever, make some effort to get those DNA samples from the current family members. It it isn't hard. (laughs) You do a cheek swab with a a Q-tip kit. And that's it. It's really simple and it's free. In fact, our female family member that had to be uh, contacted uh, because she was a St. John, they wanted the uh, uh, maternal uh, side of the family. And the only St. John maternal side of the family is a a cousin of mine that lives in Edinburgh, Scotland. And uh, I'm still in contact with her. And uh, she said, yeah, I'd be happy to, and, and uh, Fort Knox sent the kit to uh, Scotland, and she did the cheek swab, and so I did mine from the male side, and she did hers from the female side, and uh, it was so easy and free, no expense or anything. So I think the public just needs to know that that really is a high priority to get the uh, living family DNA of record so that it will be easier and then if they start accumulating 
hundreds of DNA family samples from people alive, more people then are mentally aware of the type of searches that are available, and that might be additional pressure on the government to up the ante and do a more vigorous uh, exhumation, and especially where there's a stone that says unknown here in the records throw eight. Dig them up. Let's sit, find out who they are. Yeah, yeah. You know, I agree with that 100%. And not only just for the ones that are MIA, they need that family reference samples for the ones that were actually identified yep. back in the 40s and 50s. Um, that way we can, get, we, can, we can get a full accounting of all these MIAs. Yeah, some of the pictures that I've seen uh, that come from uh, uh, Jim Opoloni and others that are involved with a lot of uh, Internet use right now, and they all of a sudden a picture shows up out of somebody's file that nobody's seen in you know decades, and there's 8 or 10 or 12 sets of bones laid out in the ground, you know, respectfully buried, but no names, no dog tags, uh, no dental records or anything, but there they are. Well, those people have family somewhere, and uh, it's not that difficult to uh, pick up each one, DNA all the uh, remains that are there for each one, uh, put them in a box if you have to, and uh, put them in a temporary thing and find out if the DNA matches anything of record, and if it doesn't, then give that person a burial uh, as an unknown with all the information, DNA information available in case it does show up someday. It just seems so simple in my mind. It, it is. It is. You know. It. it well, you know. It, it'd be a lot of work. You know. And, oh, and, sure. and time to roll up the sleeves and get it done. But I also like to like to add to what you were just saying there about uh, about the DNA and family reference samples. You know, the government, the you know, the military has one heck of a huge database of DNA already on file for all service members. I think since uh, yep. the the eighties or nineties, you know, they, they where they have taken blood samples, and right. uh, I I would almost bet you you could link a lot of uh, MIAs back to just those samples alone. There you go. I hadn't even thought of that. That's right. Yeah, it's through the Armed Forces DNA DNA Laboratory, the same place that uh, collects the samples for the families. Uh, they've got mm-hmm. a huge database already on file. Um, as soon as, a, like, if, if they exhumed the MIA today and was able to extract the, the necessary DNA out of the, out of the remains, um, you know, they, they could possibly yep. get hits back to just that database alone. Yeah, it could be a second-generation grandnephew that's uh, currently in the military or even retired military with a DNA sample on file, and all of a sudden, bingo, here's a match. Yeah, you know? The and, bells ring and the smiles and everybody's, hey, this is exactly how it's supposed to work. <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. You know, I think that's a major, major issue. And I wish our uh, elected politicians would uh, be more responsive to inquiries and so on. I know our, uh, I'll put a plug in for our local 194th Regiment, which is a, a volunteer group I belong to that's uh, based out of our armory here in Brainerd. And uh, we're all just for the keeping the memory alive of our 194 tank guys. And uh, as one of our ventures as a 501c3, uh, we raise, you know, money to uh, promote things within the 194 reach. We have an annual uh, marathon uh, that's attended by almost 400 people now. It, it just went huge. And we have a lot of fun and a lot of, you know, retired guys and military past guys and uh, we just gather and do things. And we we addressed a letter to our two state senators. Uh, oh, gosh, this would have been three years ago. And never got a reply. Asking for information on how death march markers on the trail over in the Philippines were being destroyed by highway construction, vandals, and being desecrated. And uh, could not the... Uh, uh, Monu- Monument Commission that manages the cemetery in Manila be responsible for maintenance and upgrade on the death march markers. And we we're asking for their uh, help with ideas on how to do something, and we never got a reply from either one of them. Wow. And that kind of you know, makes you mad that at least say, I've turned this over to some- so-and-so, or thank you for your letter, I'll look into it. We never even got a reply, and uh, that tells me that sometimes the politicians need to like, 
call it a Gibbs head slap. Come on, you got to wake up, smell the roses, respond, and act. And it's not that hard. Yeah, if it, if it wasn't for Bob Bob Hudson over there in the Philippines, yes. you know, if it wasn't for him yep. and his wife taking care of a lot of those markers, there wouldn't be anything yeah. left, you know. And and kudos to Bob and, and for the, what he's doing and yep. and uh, you know well, keeping the memories that, alive uh, over there. That guy over there is down to seventy years old, and you know how long can one person uh, take on the gauntlet? Although I think he's starting to get some help. And yet, a couple of days ago, another monument was desecrated by some project, and uh, he can't do it alone. And uh, he, he's not going to live forever, and neither am I. And I know he'll probably listen to this podcast, but uh, I think those people do such a tremendous job of trying to keep things uh, visible and appreciated you know, by the local communities over there. And the least we could do is uh, get the Monument Commission involved uh, so, because that stays there forever. And those people in the Monument Commission that maintain the cemetery at Manila, they change staff and people move on and they appoint new staff. There's always somebody there. Well, they can be a maintenance crew that goes out and maintains these things on a regular basis, and there you have your uh, long-term program in place so that when Bob has to retire from doing that heavy work, there's somebody to pick it up for him. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Him and a lot. There's a lot of uh, you know American uh, veterans that are living over there that uh, do an excellent job of you know trying to keep things up and and uh, you know I really appreciate everything that they're doing. And I, oh, I think absolutely. I think uh, Bob every once in a while has little fundraisers. Uh, if you yep. get, if if listeners want to get on Facebook on there's a Facebook page called Battle of Baton, and uh, Bob's one of the uh, authors of that page and you know you get a hold of Bob and see what see what you can do to help him out um, yeah because yeah. I'm pushing 70 myself and there's no way I'd be out there on my hands and knees with a paintbrush and a scraper you know for very long in uh, in a hot sun in a humid environment and a lot of rain and you know uh, trying to maintain these things is not always easy and uh, then working with the local government units that are moving them because they want to redo a road or change the curb or a car runs into one of them. And it's a lot of work. And uh, those guys, they just hang in there, and they're troopers. Yeah. Did you did you have a chance, you know, we were talking, you were talking about getting, talking to your state senators and not getting any responses back. I guess it was the congressional, one of the congressional committees here about a week or so ago had a, um, a hearing with the DPAA and and uh, the League of Families and uh, a group called History Flight that's been doing a lot of stuff with Tarawa uh, Marines and mm-hmm. MIAs. Did you have a chance to watch that hearing? No, I didn't. Uh-uh. I wish I could have. <laughs> you know, it was it was real interesting to me because the, the the congressmen and women were starting to ask some real hard questions of the DPAA. Um, but it kind of seemed like, uh, they were kind of getting, their answers were kind of getting blown off about, you know, how responsive the DPA is to the families and, and, uh, you know, what more could be done. And it just seemed like everything was money, 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 you know, is what, what they were saying. Um, you mm-hmm. know, they were talking a good game about how they're partnering with all these other agencies, but, you know, like, like we were just talking about a few minutes ago, you know, there's a lot more that can be done. Mm-hmm. And, well, and, and then and those politicians uh, have to get on board with the right questions, and they should be saying the taxpayers that are paying for everybody in this room at this hearing are asking for a simple thing to be done, and that's to do what logic says to do, and that's exhume DNA sample and uh, try to attempt to match and have a more rigorous attempt to get more family DNA samples. And there was an opportunity for both those units to be held kind of to the taxpayer thumb and say, come on, if you need more money, then tell us what you're going to do with it, and we'll get the money. The money's there. It always is there for anything, it seems. Yeah, I I agree. Um, And, you know, hopefully hopefully your your, uh, congressmen and senators are listening. We'll get to listen to this this, uh, podcast to 
to learn more about, you know, the issues that our World War II families are facing uh, with the need for mm-hmm. family reference samples. And, and hopefully, you know, like we've been talking, that they move to a DNA lead process where they actually exhume these graves and get DNA out of these, out of the RMIAs or our unknowns. Yeah. So, well, is there anything else you want to add to the to the conversation, Jim? Anything we might have look overlooked or? Well, I've kind of been looking through my notes here, and we've covered such a a wide swath of uh, information and uh, updates, and you know, unique things that have happened on our particular family case. And I think we've kind of gone over everything uh, from what I can see on my notes, and uh, I'm comfortable that we've covered the the primary ones that need to be talked about so that maybe other families can say you know that that doesn't sound like a bad idea we should do that that's what i'm encouraging uh, families of mia to do is and whether it's from the philippines world war ii or indonesia or uh, vietnam or korea if the families out there have not submitted uh, to the family reference samples they should and uh if not for those particular immediate family, perhaps their children in the future might take an interest in whatever happened to Uncle Fred or Grandpa John or something. And somebody another 10, 20 years down the road says, let's find out what happened. Well, uh, get those samples in now, and that's going to help uh, shake the tree a little bit uh, with the DPAA. And uh, also, the more samples there are, the more public eye there's going to be on the whole process. Yes, sir. I agree hundred percent on that. Yeah. It's, it seems like, uh, you know, the families don't, you know, they might've heard about a relative that died somewhere overseas during a war. And, and, uh, mm-hmm. it's not until that they, they actually get on like ancestry.com and start researching and, and doing a little bit of family history that they actually realize that they're still missing an action and that, uh, yeah. they learn yeah. that something actually can be done. And, and, um, Hopefully, hopefully uh, more families will hear about this and, and start providing family reference samples. And then the other thing, yep. you know, one of the things that I do on helping families is when they get a case record, um, they they share that case record with me so I can actually search out these families and find current current uh, descendants that are viable family reference sample donors, and uh, I give them that information so they can ta- contact the other families to, to provide that FRS. Um, and there's been a few cases here where we ran into where, um, families, you know, they, they, they kind of believe in the sanctity of the grave and they don't think those graves should be, you know, their, their loved one's grave shouldn't be disturbed, even though they're listed as an unknown. But again, it all comes back to that, uh, that, uh, commingling of the remains and, and, uh, you know, it's not just their loved one in that grave. You know, it's it's other families, and and hopefully they yeah. decide that you know they should provide that family reference sample as well. Well, and and the family thinks that that particular uh, soldier in the family was uh, not well known. Maybe there's no long term family behind them uh, to do anything except maybe one person, and they might just have the thought of mind that uh, let's leave him over there. Uh, he's been Uh, gone for a long time Uh, well uh, that's true but on the flip side if they get the dna they can confirm that's who it is and yes we will leave him here if that's your choice they have a choice they can leave him in the philippines yes but but the other guys buried with them might be somebody that they want back back home here in the states so let's let's help everybody get what they want and uh, and they don't have to be involved. You know, they can say, here's my sample, and they can say, yep, we found that uh, third cousin of yours, and uh, would you like him brought back home? And he could say, no, leave him where he's comfortable, and that's the end of it, and that's fine. I'm okay with that. Yep, and, and the guy, you know, the, the, the POW or the MIA that was in the Philippines, you know, left over in the Philippines, the big difference there is he'll be actually be buried under a marble cross that has his name on it. That's right. Exactly right. Yep. And giving him the honor and the dignity that he deserves for the sacrifice that he paid for our country and for our freedom that we absolutely. enjoy today. Oh. Yeah, it's absolutely. Well, Jim, I really, really yeah. appreciate you doing this and uh, telling telling Julius's story and 
and uh, getting information out there to the other families about, you know, what steps that they can take. And, and uh, you know, my, my, big, my big thing to you is, is don't give up, you know. No, no. Go to the ends no. of the earth to, to get Julius back. Uh, contact your 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 senators and your your congressmen and and congresswomen and and you know insist yep. that something happens. You know that's the only way things will get yep. done is when they you know when they hear about it. Well, and that's uh, kind of what I promised my dad before he passed that I'll I'll pick it up and run with it. And as I approach retirement age in the future, why? I'll pass it along to uh, my kids, and uh, they can pass it along to my grandkids. And, you know, the information will be there, whether in paper or digital format, for them to pick up and build on. And and then in the future, you know, maybe we'll have that uh, place in Camp Ripley uh, opened up and uh, bring Julius home. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, thank you again, Jim. And, and uh, you know, we look forward to... Uh... Hearing, hearing about Julius getting identified. Well, thank you so much for your work, John, and I'll uh, be linking your uh, podcast to all my siblings and uh, family and friends that kind of follow along on this uh, search, and uh, we enjoy the information that we get and and the tremendous work involved in doing this, this kind of information search, and, and I really appreciate the time and effort you put into this. All right. Well, thank you, Jim. You have a good day. We thank Jim Knudsen for coming on our podcast today to tell us his Uncle Julius' story. It is our hope he will be added to the active pursuit cases in some bay, be identified, and brought home for an honorable burial. We encourage our listeners to contact your congressional representatives and ask them to give additional funding to the DPAA mission for the fullest possible accounting of our World War II missing in action. We also hope they will encourage additional partnerships with agencies and research organizations who could help process the remains of our MIAs who are buried as unknowns in our national cemeteries. This has been a production of the U.S. POW MIA Family Locating. You can find us on the web at www.uspowmiafamilylocating.com. Thank you for listening.